Hey everybody, I'm Jason, your host of Let Freedom Reign, an equine industry leading podcast that talks to folks from all different walks of life who share their testimony of adversities and perseverance and how the horse has helped them through their journey. Stay tuned. We're going to have a great time. Come along for the ride. Welcome everybody to this week's episode here at Let Freedom Reign podcast. Our guest this week is Joe Dickinson. Now, Joe is a woman of many talents, and in this episode, she explained how the horse provided stability through some very challenging times in her life growing up. Joe is currently an entrepreneur and runs her dog training business alongside her husband, Chris Dickinson, who happened to be last week's guest on the show. Additionally, Joe is a mother, horsewoman, and podcast host herself. Now, should you find the content of this episode valuable, please share it with a friend. Additionally, your five-star ratings and reviews on the podcast platform of your choice would mean the world to us. You can find us on both Facebook and Instagram under Let Freedom Reign Podcast. I hate to keep you all waiting any longer. Here is Joe Dickinson. Good morning, Joe. How are you? Good. How are you? Good, good, good. Well, first and foremost, I want to thank you for making time for everybody here at Let Freedom Reign Podcast. And last week, we spoke with your husband, Chris, had a phenomenal conversation about business decisions and and kind of making that huge decision of leaving the security of, of quote unquote, corporate America for for small business and all of the unknowns that come along with that. And obviously with this with this episode, we'll follow up and kind of develop some of those concepts and kind of get your perspective on the, the journey traveled with that. In doing so, I know you kind of run, Chris alluded that you run the, the dog training side of the business. And how are things going there in Utah in the, in the dog training world? Yeah, so the dog training world is is growing. Um, I I think our love for animals and as a whole as a society um, has turned a corner that uh, in, in a very good way and a very healthy way, um, and and the business is is strong. I think in this day and age and the way the world is this, that that uh, animals are. Kind of a retreat for people. It's a it's a breath of fresh air, and um, and I think that's a, a piece of why it's growing so well. Yeah, and I think, and we'll get into your story and as it relates to horses and things. But the animals allow us to reflect in a way that we can't, for whatever reason, human beings can't find in ourselves or or amongst ourselves. You know, it's it's incredible what we can learn from these animals. Oh, yeah. I mean, that statement alone just it just gave me the chills because I I think that I think animals call us out on our shit yeah. um, in a way that you can't deny it. Yeah. Um, but they're also not judging. I was going to say they're very, they're very tactful in their approach. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah. So let's get into a little bit of your history. Now, I know you have kind of a unique story growing up with your father who's a, a Vietnam vet and, and horses kind of played a huge role in, in helping move things along with the family. Yeah. So, uh, you know, growing up, we we lived uh, somewhat, you know, I would say out of a suitcase or out of a box um, in a sense, having uh, a father with PTSD when we were growing up, that was not a thing. Uh, you didn't talk about it. Um, nobody was recognizing it. And so there was not a year that would go by that we, I say we, my brother and sister and I even was in the same school, in the same house, in the same location. Um, we bounced around between Utah, Texas, and California. Um, and, and really the only thing that was stable in, in our lives was the animals and, um, there were times that we had to give up our animals because dad was um, what I call is, you know, dad was on the run and we, we never knew what he was running from. Um, but my mom was very supportive and we would go on the run with him. And so the animals became anywhere we would go, you know, we, I uh, would find something, a cat, a dog, find a pasture of horses. It was very much so that was my draw because we knew we would be leaving soon. And so making friends and was not really uh, a skill we got to develop and, and to get, have long time friends was not anything that was in, in the cards for us. I think it's incredible. If you think back, I mean, 
God, we could do so many episodes on on <laughs> that era of American history, right? Yep. In Vietnam yep. and, and how yeah. society treated those those men and women who served and and the atrocities of combat and the standards in which I mean, subjected them to horrific violence. Oh, yeah. Yep. Now you think about, I mean, in looking back, I mean, your father probably stood no chance in in helping himself or getting help. You know, you talked about right. it's something that was not talked about then. It's it's just now that we're getting to to making these open forums discussing the mental health side of of our right. soldiers and, and our law enforcement in this country. And in your opinion, now looking back and reflecting, right, at some yeah. point you you have that light bulb moment, you know, that that's what dad was suffering from. Yeah. Yep. Yep. What do you think? Was he running trying to find comfort or he just didn't know what he was running from? Um, I don't think he knew what he was running from. Yeah. yeah. Um, because there was no, there was never a rhyme or reason and there was never, it was never a settling point for, for him ever, no matter what he did. I mean, oh, you know, he was a deckhand on a shrimp boat in Texas um, to being a design engineer and a draftsman. You know, I oh, mean, really? it was just, uh, we, he went from career to job to job to, um, there was never a point of where we landed that it was a place of settling for him. So I think it was more, I got to get out of here. I got to go because it, it's something uncomfortable myself. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. How tough I feel for him. You know, it's just. Yeah. It's tough because I've talked with many service members on the show and previous guests have mentioned, you know, that the, the that our country's military can take a civilian and make an extremely, extremely proficient warfighter. Mm-hmm. But we have a hard time taking that warfighter and turning him back into to a civilian or a citizen, right. you know? And, yep, yep. And in all of the strides that we've made now, we still have so, so much more to go. And how tough for for your mother? I mean, she she had to have been a strong soul. Yeah. You, you children, right. because in looking in, at it, I mean, growth and all of this stuff. And you talk about the skill set of making friends. I mean, there are very few things that you had the opportunity to do because you were on the move. Right. Yep. Yeah. For sure. And I think what's incredible with a lot of of what's discussed on this show, and and I'm sure we'll we'll get to it here in a little bit, is that. We often have more control of a scenario or a situation than what we give ourselves credit for, right? Oftentimes people play the victim role, you know, poor oh, me, sure. why me, how did it happen to me? But, yep. but, you know, effort and attitude are two things that you can control no matter what, you know? And, yep. Yep. and if you could maybe expand on, you, you alluded to it that the animals provided stability for you, but what was... What was your decision making and thought process and development in all of this time of your life as far as, you know, trying to find that stability and growth and development and, and not playing the poor me card? Well, I think, uh, you know, one, I, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a pretty emotional topic for me because I never, uh, I never was in that zone because I always found the comfort in the animals. And so, you know, even just sitting out there on a fence in some stranger's pasture watching the horses be horses and just dreaming about, you know, what's life for them? What, you know, look mm-hmm. how simple it is. And, mm-hmm. you know, there was there was even a point in time that we were, got on a Greyhound bus and we lived on the streets um, with my dad. And, and, you know, we had food and... I don't know. The horses withstood the elements. My dog was always, you know, my dad wrapped a dog in a blanket and we took it on the bus as a child. I mean, it was just the animals really kept it real for me that there is there's nothing to complain about. And when my dad finally, uh, Chris, Chris and I uh, finally convinced him to get to get help and that the the VA is not there to kill him and that they will help him. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, yeah. and he, he, uh, he had attempted suicide twice and, and he ended up living with us for a good stretch of time. And it, it really was life is okay. Life is yeah. because the animals really just make it okay. And, and so I never went down that path and, 
So my dad got help and, and he sat down and he wrote a lot and he started sharing things with me and he looked at me and he said, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry for the dad that I was. And I said, you know, I'm not sorry for that because my life is full and I have no fears. I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid to, to give up and lose everything that I have because, because I, I can make it. And, um, and maybe that's good and maybe that's bad, but I've, I've been through two divorces and I left everything. If you want it all, it's fine. I'll be fine. I'll figure it out. And I did. And so, you know, things are not important to me. Um, but every day being able to just appreciate what I have. And, and I think that's what my dad gave, gave me my brother and sister feel differently and they're still, they still carry some anger um, of him. But I just really appreciate what, what that life experience gave me because it really is about what, what you make it. And it's an incredibly mature perspective that you take, you know, because as you think about it, right, you're a child, you don't have a lot of say, right. in what takes right. place, but in the yep. same regard, did your father really have much of a say, you know, right. and, and yeah. for you to have the foresight and understand his position and be empathetic to that position and willing to get him help. And, and it's one of those things like, I, I feel for your father and the fact that, you know, he feels sorry for, for the type of father he was at times. Yet, yeah. Yep. Yet the poor soul probably didn't stand a chance with a lot of it, you know, and, right. and right. all of the yep. pressures of trying to be a father and deal with the atrocities of his deployments and, It's just absolutely incredible. And the great part about a lot of this is in talking about perspective is that we oftentimes think of imperfections as deficiencies or losses, right? Or or a negative mar on on our records in life. But all of those quote unquote inequities are opportunities to grow, opportunities to develop perspectives and and become more resilient than than we were before and better versions of ourselves, you know, the yeah. Sometimes those trenches run deep and sometimes it's extremely painful lessons to be learned, but but you come away with a, a, a greater sense of humility, right? A greater sense of confidence and, and like you described, not hanging on to things in life, but maybe focusing more on relationships and people and right and those things that you can't necessarily take with you, you know, when it's all said and right. done. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's I I think that animals teach us that, right? I, I I really do because it's not they don't they don't really care they have food and maybe shelter they can survive without shelter yeah um and and I think that they if you sit back and just appreciate what they have to give us I think that that's really what they they teach us yeah and that's the biggest thing and I I work with a lot of law enforcement and vets. And just introducing them to the horse, right? And, and mm-hmm, mm-hmm. it's starting to, I think the first steps in any of this, and, and whether it's recovery or learning horsemanship or or becoming more proficient in anything, and we'll discuss dogs here in a little bit as well because of your training background with, with the dogs, it's developing that awareness in the human being, right? Yeah. That's yep. where the first step really, really takes place. And, and the horse allows you to learn how to be in the moment. And I tell people, the greatest gift that the horse has given me is is patience and grace. Those were two lessons that I I did not give myself. And and through yeah. the horse and, and trying to find my ways, you know, when I was struggling, it's stuff that I carry on in, in everyday life now. And you can start to understand people's perspective. Now, you don't have to agree with it and you don't have to condone sure. it. Yep. But at least you're tolerant of, of people's situations and scenarios. For sure, for sure. So I um, connecting the dogs into the horse world. We, my dad, eventually settled. Um, uh, we were just in Utah, so we moved quite a bit still, but we were able to have uh, uh, horses. And and um, I'm not sure he. We grew up. He was uh, at some point. He was a bronc rider. Um, at some point, he was. Um, chasing the Mustangs in the West Desert here in Utah. Um, so our life was full of these crazy adventures. Um, and so the horses were were definitely a part of our lives. And so somehow he hooked up with somebody that had horses as we were older and, and we got, he, you know, he got us horses and, 
And, um, and that's where I spent the majority of my junior, um, junior high and high school years was at the barn, um, with my dog trying to figure out how these things worked and how they thought and how can you teach them. And so between the horse and the dog, they went through a lot with me, um, trying to figure out how they think yeah. so that I could get them to do things that, uh, you know, a young girl would only dream. Let's, let's see if you can get on a box and let's see if you can get on the fence and then get on the horse and let's see if the horse accepts this predator jumping on you. And so I, I, both of that, the horse and the dog were a part of my life growing up. And my dad, um, you know, again, everything that he did, he meant well, but didn't really think about the feelings of anything. But as soon as regret, we graduated, even though my sister and I were paying for the horses, he sold everything out from underneath us and told us we were going to college. Oh, so, no. yeah, so that was, you know, it was just kind of a breaking point for me where I was, I was done with my dad for a while. I just needed to get away because everything that I had built up through that time um, was gone. And so, you know, getting back into the horses um, after I had my daughter, why well, I was in the horses before that, but um, it's different being a dog trainer and living with predators and then going into riding and teaching a horse because now you no longer can be the predator. You have to be the prey with them. Yeah. And um, I think with anybody that can find therapy through the horses, the horses, one, make you vulnerable because you have to be the prey. And that's really not what we want to do as human beings. I would say we're hardwired not to. Yeah. Yep. We're an apex and, predator, really. Yep, yep. And so I had a trainer. Uh, we had a colt, and and uh, he he was just he's he's a, I just love him. He's just this hippie guy that he really got into the soul of the horse. And he said to me, he says, you know, these these animals are the only things that we ever surrender our life to, and that they surrender theirs to ours, and they have a choice. And they and they make that choice um, to do that. And he said to me, you have to stop being the predator. And it was a big aha moment for me, because when you're training dogs, you're the predator. <laughs> you know, you're, you're living in that world. So as you sit was, here and describe it, I had that exact moment, right? Yeah, like we talked a little bit off air. Uh, I work dogs a little bit from a functional standpoint, other than just obedience and, and being house pets. And yeah. And you could, correct me if any of this is wrong because you were the expert in it, you can be the dominant pack leader, right? And and oftentimes that dominance comes from aggression, right? right. Or, or a certain level of, of assertion. When you start working with the horse, you have to be a leader, right? And yeah. a leader yeah. doesn't necessarily always lead through aggression, assertion, physical no. dominance, right? There's more of a right. psychological component to to a leader. And I use the dichotomy of there's leadership and there's supervisors, right? Yep. With a dog, you can kind of supervise and manage a dog. That's not going to work with a horse. You can't do the whole micromanagement thing, right? It's got to be, they have to be invested and they have to truly believe in their heart that, that you have their well-being in mind. And what an incredible shift. I didn't literally have never given it any thought until you brought it up, whatever it was, two minutes ago that yeah. What a huge, huge perspective change to go from working dogs in a field and then, then jump in a pen with a horse. You have to make a huge shift oh, big in your time. perspective and approach. It's incredible. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, my horses are my uh, release out of this world of, of running a business. And, um, and it's a place for me to be vulnerable and just give it all, just give it all right there. And, and that's, you know, luckily enough in my life, when Chris came into my life, um, we were, we were in a point of, you know, Chris is an incredible human being and, and he is so supportive in, in dreams. And, and so getting the horses, my daughter, uh, was just, she was, I, you know, she's a spitting image of me and she, I don't know, like her life is just like 
me with the animals. So her passion is the horses. And she started riding when she was two. And Chris was very supportive of that. And, and Chris has nurtured that along that we, us girls are lucky enough to get to be cowgirls when we want to be cowgirls. And, and, uh, he, he pushes my daughter in a way in the horse world that, you know, she said to me, I want to do high school rodeo. I'm like, we can't do high school rodeo. I don't have the time for that. And Chris said, let's do it. Let's, let's just do it. Let's figure it out. And, and he took her on a very brave journey that she's never, you know, she wanted to rope and she wanted to tie goats. And I said, you've got to be kidding me because you have (laughs) never done any of that. And she said, that's what I want to do. So, uh, you know, her, her life with the horses have been, you know, her learning just to surrender it all and trust her horse and, and have that relationship. And it's, uh, it's an amazing journey. We have our dogs and we work our dogs and we, we love the dog side of the world, but the horses really, um, I think make a human being vulnerable. Yeah. It, and it, it's it, a good place to be. You had touched on it earlier, right? It allows you to, to open up free of judgment, right? Yep. And we've talked yeah. numerous times with many, many guests on this show you know, you can use the terms equine assisted activities or equine assisted learning or hippotherapy. And with some of these more machismo professions, right? Law enforcement, military and things of that sort. And and part of us have it regardless of profession is it no matter how close you are to a human being, when you really start to open up and, and spill your heart, there's always that little bit of reservation of am I going to get judged or at what level yeah. am I going to get judged, right? And, right, and when right, you get out there yeah. with the horse, there is none of that. They don't even have the ability to do it, you know? Right, and, yeah. And it allows, it allows the human being to be so raw and so honest with themselves to a level. I mean, I couldn't tell you the times early on when I would just go sit in the stall. Yeah. And just yep. exist with the horse and and – you talked about all of the pressures of running a small business, right? And, and the go, yeah. go, go and the hustle of that and, and the horses are your release. You know, a lot of us who are type A and, and very driven, we have no problem mashing the gas pedal, right? Right. But yep. letting off of yeah. it is a very, very hard lesson to learn. And the horse affords you the opportunity to just exist in the moment yeah. free of obligation. And Yep. And it provides an incredible opportunity to recharge your life's batteries so you can rededicate yourself, you know, once it is time to step on the gas pedal again. Right, right. Yep, exactly. Exactly. And I think I think dogs have a lot to offer, but it's it's just so different. And it, it's it's just a different mentality where a dog tends to be more of a protector for you and it brings comfort that way where the horse really says, no, it's all, it's all good. It's, yeah. all, it's all good. We yeah. can run. Yeah. We, we can run. So, um, and I think that's why the horses also for me growing up was significant because we were, we were running, you know, and, and I have a blog that's, uh, the title is, a, is that dog Sam? And that, that was my first dog. And I talked a lot about running. Um, you know, dad was always running, but I always had that dog Sam. And, and and going to the barn and and the and the dog brings the sense of safety and the horse brings a sense of vulnerability. So in going back through your story, you know, you talk about the comfort that the animals brought and the stability that the animals brought and as a young girl, right, you know it just feels good, but you probably don't know why. Yeah. At, at what point in your life did you have that light bulb moment in understanding truly what the what the horse and what the dogs were were providing you emotionally? Um, I I believe it was when I when I went through my first divorce. When I looked back and thought, you know, I I had my dogs. I wasn't afraid. There was no fear. You know, obviously it's sad, but I got married young. We grew up together and it was like, you know, this isn't working. Mm-hmm. <laughs> there was, it wasn't a bad divorce. It wasn't, yeah. it was just, you know, I got married young and, and, um, and, but I wasn't afraid. And, and that was the point for me where as long as I have the animals, it's, oh, it's okay. And then looking back on my life, that's really what made it okay. 
we survived. We're fine. But really, it was the animals a part of our lives all the time. And, and, I, and I feel like I have my mom to thank for that because she was always, just don't tell your dad. He'll come home to it. It's fine. You know, she always allowed <laughs> that door to be open for us. And, uh, and I think it was her way of trying to help us find yeah, yeah. balance. So, yeah. yeah. It'd be interesting to get her perspective to see, you know, maybe what she saw as far as changes in her children. You know, I know, what, if, and if unfortunately an, she passed away, so... That's a bummer. Yeah, yeah. It's so, a, I wonder I, if it I, was an intentional act on her part, you know, to be silly. Right, it. yeah, yeah, I, um, yeah, that's, that was another hard point in our life of, after that, that's when things kind of spiraled pretty hard for my dad, and, and, uh, he, that's when he attempted suicide twice, and got married several times trying to figure out life. So, yeah. yeah. So it's crazy. in such a, such a lifetime of instability, you know, those, those animals yeah. were always there to provide in some cases, just enough stability to put yep. one foot right back in front of the other, you know? And yeah. And that's what I think a lot of people need to understand with, with life in general and your interactions with animals is that in the forgiveness we give ourselves, you know, we don't need to make huge strides and bounds, right? Sometimes, right. sometimes trying is enough and you got to be okay with that. And sometimes a small step in the right direction is it, just enough to keep you going. And I was going to say, and being for, and being forgiving enough in yourself to understand that, you know, we're not always going to move in the right direction. Sometimes yeah. we, we could get that one stride, but we fall three or four, you know? Yep. Yeah. It's, it's incredible. I I just, I'm such a believer of if you just go in a direction, things will happen the way they're supposed to happen. And, and that direction might not be good to start with. And, you know, it it's not about, a, it's not about little steps. It's not about big steps. It's about just, just taking the step. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's about having, um, I don't really call them dreams. It's more about just having a vision. I, I follow, I follow my heart a lot and, and I can do a lot. And, and I think that people just don't give themselves enough credit that you, you just, you got up this morning and, and there's a tree outside and that's pretty amazing. And, and that's, that's a step. That's, yeah. that's a step, you yeah. know, and opening the curtains and it's a step. It doesn't mean it's going to fix anything, but it, it's just, just taking it's progress nonetheless. Yeah. 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 And yep. Chris and I talked a lot about it last week and by nature, I think a lot more along the lines that he, that he does, right. He's a lot more conservative and, and kind of <laughs> yep. calculated in his approach <laughs> and, yep. and developing change. Whereas you know, he describes you as just kind of just going for it sometimes, but <laughs> yeah. uh, it's an incredible balance. And, and and for me, I used to, and I still have elements of it in my in my personality. I wanted to be in such control of everything that it yeah. oftentimes would devour me. You know, and uh, with the strength of my faith and placing a lot of my life's decisions in God's hands and and relinquishing some of that control. It's just so much more liberating, and and it's provided me a lot more opportunity that I can't say I would have gotten trying to to live the life that I had planned. If that makes sense. Sure. Yep. Yep. I think you have to trust people, and and what do you have to lose? Yeah. I, I just there's what do you have to lose? We, we poked fun at that last week when he talked. We were talking about the change. <laughs> I'm like, what do you have to lose? I mean, you could be homeless. You could not have bills. You could, yeah. Right? But okay. Then, but then when we sit here and I talk to somebody that's been in that scenario, it's like, okay, well, that argument doesn't work. So I don't know where to go from here. <laughs> um, yeah. he um, Chris's first month off from, I said, okay, it's time. Let's just do this. Oh, like, man. We're I, done living this. And that first month, I'm like, maybe you should go back to work. You have got, you've got to do something. You, you've got to figure it out and you've got to do something because yeah. this is driving me nuts. I don't know what to do, Joe. I don't, yeah. you know, I'm like, make a list. I don't know. You've got to do something. It was, it was hard for him. Yeah. Well, how many um, people do that in retirement, right? They, 
<laughs> you worked your whole entire yeah. life to retire yeah. to turn around and go back to work? Like, right. It's yeah. hard for human beings to sit still, and, and especially people that are in go, go, go professions where, yeah. you know, you have goals and you have targets and you have things you got to hit and accomplish. And if you're not getting to that point, uh, you don't feel so fulfilled. Whereas people who are more, maybe this is a bad term, but more free spirits, you know, you can sit on the yeah. porch and just watch the birds fly through the trees and you're okay with that. Yeah. You know, and that's an accomplished morning or an accomplished start to your day. Sure. You know, I, um, my mom, my mom died fairly young. Um, she was 56 and I, I am living, I'm living my retirement as I go. I, I just, I, I ride my horse every day. Yeah. Um, we haul hay, we, you know, and sometimes I go, what the hell am I doing? I'm almost 50, but it feels good and I'm good. And, and I'm not waiting. I'm not waiting for that time because I, I don't know if I'm going to get that time. Yeah. And, and, and I think, you know, that comes along with just not having fear. What, what do you have to lose? It's a, it's a very, very powerful statement. And it's fun, something that's very, very difficult to believe. Yeah. That's really where, where the, the separation takes place in a lot of this stuff. And, and in going through Chris's story and, and your story alike, those are huge changes to make right? To give up the mm -hmm. comfort of corporate world. But I have found in the last few years that, like you talked about living your retirement, if it's something that you truly, truly love, why, why would you want to leave it? Right. Why do you got to walk away? You know? Right. We yep. retire from these jobs because they're just destroying okay. us, right? Yeah. Yeah. Right. They truly are. There's... Yep. I work with any number of guys that I work with, right? They're counting the days. And some of those days are right. decades away, you yeah. know? Yep, and, for sure. And when you find that that true love or that true passion or that true fire, whatever it may be, you can't go a day without it. Right. But it's hard to yeah. find that. And it's hard to, it's hard because traditional corporate jobs or your nine to five provide you that stability and passion professions usually don't. So how do you make that leap? What are you willing to give up? All All of the, the calculations that go into it, but well, I th I think society takes us in that direction, you know, as a whole, and and you know, if I could get under the skin of so many people and say, you you can make it, you can make it doing whatever you want to do, and and you, the retirement, there's resources out there to set up your own retirement. I mean, it's just yeah. you can make it, and and. You know, is it hard? I don't know. Everything is hard. Yeah, if I had, ain't that when the I had truth. to get up and go to work in the corporate world, it was that was hard. You know, so you know, hard for me is man. There's some things that just suck, but hard is not everything is hard. Yeah. Everything is yeah. so. So, what hard do you want to take? That's true. That's very, very true. It's an incredible point you make. So. I, uh, I I have a completely different thought process because I just, you know, I, I thank my dad for that no fear of just, let's do it. Let's do it. Let's make it happen. No, it is. It's it's incredible in all of this, you know. Uh, this show has gone a direction I, I had no idea it would go, you know. And, and you bring, for me personally, right, you bring an incredible perspective that, that I've often pondered in life but never really committed to thinking about. And it's a, it's an incredible approach. It's an exciting approach. It's a scary approach, you know, something that's oh, so foreign to so many people. But, but here you are living proof of all of it. You know, you've always been, I can't say you always been, that's an absolute statement, but <laughs> oftentimes in life you have been handed these very, very challenging situations, but look at yeah. all of the positive perspective that has come out yeah. of it, you know? Yep. Yep. And, and that's a huge testament to your personality, right? Your fortitude, your resilience, all of that stuff. But like we talked about, tough people and successful people, you know, they're made. Yeah. Right? Well, you make it. Yeah. You, you make it. Yeah. It's all work nonetheless. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely yep, incredible. For sure. So let's talk a little bit about your evolution through, through the dog world. You know, you talked about... Yeah training professionally for a couple decades now and and oftentimes in life we we have these goals and aspirations and these professions that we want to do yet life happens and none of it ever, ever works out so 
I know for you, dogs played a huge role in your development and growth. Um, was yeah. training professionally something that was always on your radar? Um, I don't know that training professionally was. Um, dogs were always on my radar, and owning my own business was always on my radar. And I had I had trained dogs um, professionally making a living at it many times, but having the right support group is really what having somebody that believes in you is really um, where everything shifted for me. And that, and that was Chris uh, for me where I said, you know, this is really what I want to do. I've been trying to get there. And he said, well, if anybody can do it, it's you. And, and I looked at him, I said, really? And he goes, just let's do it. Um, and, and having that support system, because it's, it, it's tiring. Sometimes you're out the door at eight o'clock every morning. You're, you know, some nights I'm home at nine, 10 o'clock at night. Yeah. Um, sometimes Chris and I see each other in passing and, and the kids fit into that somehow, you know? And so, it, yeah, I think, you know, having the right support is really where I finally got off the runway and was able to do it. Really take off. So yeah. what has been some of your experiences, and, and we've we've touched on a few of them briefly, but what have been some of your experiences from a dog training perspective as far as lessons learned in working with these dogs and, and, and how you can apply some of those lessons to how you live life? One of the biggest things is not being... Um, not putting titles and words onto people. We have a tendency to put words like, oh, it's a rescue. The poor thing didn't have. Oh, I'm pretty sure it was beat. Um, and then they treat the dog as such. And the dog really doesn't want to be that. And um, I think in society today, we title a lot of people. Um, we put that on a lot of people and it's not who they want to be, but it's what we have titled it. I, I, Cheyenne's dad is, is a retired police officer and he, there's times I have to remember and we have to remind Cheyenne that everything that he saw and dealt with was not pleasant. It's not like he was helping a little old lady across the street have yeah. a conversation, you know, um, and that, you know, what he sees is way different than what an, somebody in a different career sees. And, and, but we put the title, oh, you're in law enforcement. And then we just automatically go there, right? That this is who you are or, oh, you're, you're a pit bull. So you're automatically going to be you know, a dog fighting, nasty yeah, people biting, yeah. killing, you know. So I think the titles that we put on um, people is something that as watching people in their homes put titles on their dogs that they don't want. The dogs don't want to be. They don't know that they're rescued. They don't know that they were homeless. They don't know that somebody gave them up. They don't know that they ran away from home somewhere. <laughs> Somebody, I mean, they don't know that, you know, and, yeah. and, um, it, we put titles on, on dogs. And I think that we do that as people and it's something that we should not do. It's a very personal point that you bring up, you know, when I think about working with, with my horse, I tell people that I have found in my walk that some of these quote unquote broken horses have the most to give. And, yeah. and as I go through this show, I'm learning that it's human alike. Yeah. Right? Some of the most incredible people, the most giving, kind, warm personalities at face value have been mm -hmm. some of the most broken, beaten, and destroyed people that, sure. that you you would come across. And my horse, he's he's a gelding, he was he was a rope horse and early on I wanted to rope and and, and I I I knew things were not going right. They were not going in a direction <laughs> that I wanted to go, right? But I was very, yeah. very, very green, very green. Yeah. And uh, I might be a shade or two lighter than when I started, but green nonetheless. <laughs> um, but we started to, for example, right during his pre-purchase, he has a little trauma in, in one of his eyes and, and the vet alluded. At some point, he something 
traumatic happened to this eye, whether somebody uh-huh. hit him or whipped him or, you know, he got hung up on a tree or something along those lines. But sure. in in really starting to soul search with this horse, you find that, that he's just, he's inherently nervous, right? He was very untrustworthy mm-hmm. um, in talking to a lot of folks about his history. You know, he get pulled out of the stall, they get roped on, they put him right back up. Yep. Yep. So his his interaction with human beings was always high stress, high pressure, yet never really given the foundation to to handle any of that. Yeah. And and as I work with this horse and and I was told when I purchased him, you know, you can't do this and you have to do this and you will never mm-hmm. do that. And all of that stuff is is years behind us now. We've accomplished all those goals that we were quote unquote never supposed to do. Right, right. And you yep. really start to see that this horse is so kind and so forgiving and he wants to try so hard, but deep down in his core, and I don't know if it's it's human intervention in his upbringing or if, if part of it is his personality, you know, that, that mm-hmm. sometimes he can't get out of his own way or sometimes he just can't shake sure. that one little bit, you know? And, yeah. And it's yep. tough because people have probably jacketed this horse as, you know, he's a little, he's wound a little too tight, or maybe you don't think as clear sure. as he should, or, you know, whatever, whatever title they want to throw on it. But, but when you put in the hours and when you get to know the animal or you get to know the human alike, I mean, the conversation yeah. that we just had parallels humans to it, to an extent, you never really know what you're going to get, right? You never, you right. never know. And you take this interview, for example, right? I knew very little of you. I talked to Chris a little bit about it. He said you train dogs a little bit. You'd be you'd be an awesome candidate for the show. I said, heck, let's do it, right? Yeah. Never once. This is probably one of the more deeper conversations that I've had with anybody. You know, that's been on this well, show, and it's good. it's it's all incredible value, and it's the greatest grace in it is that you're you're open enough and you're willing and enough to let this stuff be true and honest and heart heartfelt. And hopefully, an effort to to get through to somebody who may be experiencing similar circumstance that you you grew up in. Sure, you know, and I just I just think there's a lot of meanness in this world, and and I think that if we just sat back and you know, whether you're sitting on the back of your horse or whether you've got a dog at your side or a cat in your lap, you know, I don't think it matters. It's just really stop and look through their eyes and. And see it for what it is, and yeah. not not title, not judge, not just just be in the moment and and you know appreciate what everybody has to offer from the animals to the people, and and stop putting these titles and painting people into hole into these holes that they unfortunately get stuck in and can't get out of. Well, in my experience, a lot of this this malicious approach is it comes from personal insecurities. Sure. Right? If yep. I'm not comfortable yep. with who I am and what I am, I'm going to do my best to make you look worse than what I am. Right. Right? Yep. It goes back to the whole yep. apex predator thing and, and presenting this this image that's right. better. I mean, and you, God, we can go on to social media right now and there's 10 billion people, <laughs> right. right, that project this yeah. fantasy lifestyle yet probably can't yeah. pay the electri- electricity bill, you know? Yeah, and, right. And you just, in my in my experience, in my walk, you just... You don't know what you're going to get, and if we spent a lot more time getting to know people rather than rather than bash them or put them down or find our own comforts in our own skin, I think society as a whole would be a lot better off. Now, I'm not yeah. saying we got to run around and hug everybody because there's plenty of bad seeds that roam this earth, but, right. yeah, for but sure. we don't need to be so offensive all the time. Well, I think more than anything, you just stop stop judging. Yeah. Just stop it. You don't You don't have to... You know, I, I, I believe there's some bad animals on this earth and I think there's bad people on this earth. And I, but I think for the most part, you, you just don't, you don't have to go down that path because it's sickening, you know, and there's, there's, I don't know, there's, yeah, you don't have to love, you don't have to hug, you don't have to make friends everywhere you go, but stop, stop putting titles and stop judging because the animals don't. They don't. They don't care that you lived on the streets. It's let's get in this round pen together. Let's you know be attached on a leash and let's let's do this together. And that's all they're looking for. They're not. They they don't care where you came from. Yeah, and I think who it, you are. I think an incredible perspective that a lot of us can benefit from is is investing yourself in something greater than you. 
Yep. And, and that's where I found a lot of value and fulfillment in my life. And, and we'll take your story, for example. You have an incredible skill set that you have developed, right? And, and a lot of that has come from your experience in very, very, very trying times. Yeah. There's hundreds of thousands of people that have maybe had similar circumstances to you or felt the same feelings and are currently going through that stuff, you know? Yeah. We yep. as society, I think, owe it to the next generation, just like we're doing on this show, right? To share your perspectives, to help educate those people because their mean malice and short attitude might come from not being able to figure out what, why they're hurting. Right. Right? Yep. Yep. And that's that was the biggest motivating factor for me in, in the development of this show is that the horse had taught me some incredible things about myself. Yeah. And I am so grateful for it. If I could help one more person feel that. Now having the the assortment of guests that I have, I mean, it's just week after week after week after week of people with amazing stories, people that are extremely genuine, people that are extremely dedicated to humanity. And it's just, I think we're we're making very, very positive strides and leaps and bounds in this direction of horses helping humans, but but it's our job to advocate for that, right? Oh, for sure. For sure. Because it's a, it's a hard place to go to. It is. It's an emotional place to go to, for it sure. It is. I would yeah. say, you, you have a hard time sleeping from all that stress, right? Get out there in the in the pen and start working through some of that stress with a horse and <laughs> yeah. you won't wake up yeah. for days. It's exhausting. <laughs> Because <laughs> yeah. you, you think you're working the horse, but you're actually yeah. working on yeah. yourself, and you're like, "Oh, that's the best relief." You're ever. like, "Hold yeah. on here." Yep, <laughs> exactly. That's incredible. Yeah. Well, Good. I'll tell you what: we burned through an hour, or almost an hour, pretty darn quick. And gosh, I have one heck of a story. And, and Chris was right. You know, there's a lot. Of, <laughs> there's a lot of value in it. A lot of value in it. You know. And well, I well, th- I'm glad. I thank you for being so raw and so honest, and in every part of it, right? Because it's, it's difficult to admit what society perceives as flaw sometimes, but you know what? Sure. That's your experience. That's, that's the stories in, or the pages in your, in your book, you know? And Yeah, yeah. And in closing, I like to give everybody the opportunity. I know we didn't, shoot, we didn't even mention the, the name of the business or anything, but <laughs> should folks want to contract you for, for training services in that Utah area, how can they get a hold of you? Or how can they find out more about your business, what you have to sure. offer? So I'll, I'll give you a little bit of background. Um, Chris and I are, we started the business, it's called Western States Canine College. And we are in the process of rebranding it to Dog Training 360. And um, the reason why is we would like to go global. So even if you're not in the Utah, um, we really, um, I'm, I'm, I've got a dog trainer's school. Um, the goal is to have dog trainers all over the United States that reflect who we are and, and how we train and, and that we, we help people connect with their dogs in a different way than, than any other trainer out there. Um, and, and our goal is to, you know, go, go global. I mean, that's, that's our, our next step in this journey. And, um, so you can reach us right now at WSK9CO. And that's our handle for Instagram, Western States Canine College on Facebook, WSK9CO on Twitter. Um, and soon it will all be rebranded to Dog Training 360. I was going to say, you guys got a pretty good photographer in house, huh? He's pretty awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'm blown away that he's not formally trained or, you know, in photography that he just decided, you know, heck, we're going to give it a shot and see what comes of it. And I think that's why he's so good at what he does because yeah. he just, everything's through a different perspective. Yeah. It's passion. Yeah. It definitely sure. shows in all the work that you guys do. So in closing with every episode, I like to give guests the opportunity to kind of provide their final thoughts or or core values or perspectives that you kind of live by that you think others would benefit from, you know, do you have anything to share or to offer in that regard? My, uh, I, I really live life as life as it is right now. Um, and stop thinking about the failures and stop thinking about how you're not getting anywhere, but 
look at what the next moment, the next day, the next call, the next person has to uh, has to offer. And and I think that's really we get beat down in this world way too easy that it's that's not what it's about. And that's really the way that that I live. It's not it's not easy, um, but nothing is. It, and it, it's so stop looking at it as hard because it's life. Yeah. And that's really the way that I live. Um, let people support you. That's probably one of the hardest things that I have is because I'm, I'm strong. I'm powerful. I can be scary. I can just do it and I'm not afraid. And Chris keeps me grounded that way because sometimes I have to let people give back to me. Yeah, I was gonna say you guys are quite the quite the uh, compliment to each other. You know, it's, it's it's the best journey I've ever been on. I was gonna say it's more than obvious why you guys are successful, and the great the greatest part about all of it is it just the kindness and the genuine approach that you take, and and truly willing to help everybody. You know, when you talk about your dog training and you sharing your story, yeah. and, and Chris and all the photography workshops that he does, and everything he does through his social media, it's incredible the amount of the life that you're giving back to everybody. It's it's truly, truly awesome to watch. Well, I would say it's real. And if anybody wants to contact us, you'll what you hear here and what you heard from Chris, it's real. We don't we don't judge. And you know, I've if you want to meet a horse, I have a horse that you can meet. And if you want to spend some time with a dog, I have a dog that you can spend some time with. And if you just need somebody to talk to, we're here. I mean, we just really, people are amazing and they're, they're fabulous. So Joe, it has been absolutely incredible. I thank you very much for your time and your dedication to everybody here at Let Freedom Reign podcast. It's been a amazing hour and, and I'm looking forward to all the growth and development through your guys' training program and and the photography business and what 2019 has in store for you. It's going to be a good one. We will talk to you down the road. Sounds good. Thank you. Have a good one, Joe. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks again, everybody, for listening to this episode of Let Freedom Reign Podcast. Again, you can find us on social media under Let Freedom Reign Podcast. If you want to support the growth of this podcast, go to patreon.com forward slash Let Freedom Reign Podcast. Again, we thank you, and we'll see you on the next one.